Hi, I'm Ken Howard, and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I'd like to talk about gay male relationship advice, how to succeed in a long-distance relationship. So, as an LGBT affirmative therapy specialist, and more specifically, a specialist in gay men's therapy, the G in LGBT, gay couples therapy, gay sex therapy, and gay coaching, life, career, relationship, I'm often asked the same questions for guidance over my long 28 years career. One of these is how do gay men successfully navigate the challenges of a long distance relationship? And my answer is very carefully. Because embedded into that question is the dilemma of two or more, in polyamory, gay men in a relationship who are asking of themselves and of each other to strike a balance between the emotional and romantic closeness that they feel with the physical distance that stands between them when they live in different cities, states, or even countries or continents. This is why that dilemma sounds hard, because you really are trying to achieve closeness among distance, which sounds contradictory. However, ever since my, since my career has been so long, working with hundreds or thousands of gay male couples, I've gained through observational data, many example case studies of how gay men have had long-distance relationships and been successful, or not. As I like to say, the older I get, the stronger my opinions get, because there have just been so many case examples that either underscore what tends to work or illustrate what doesn't work across many different kinds of gay male couples, national origin, ethnicity, economic class, the age of the partners, etc. So when people hire me for gay couples therapy or coaching, part of what they are paying for in a consultation is that long experience and abundance of data of how previous gay male couples handled the challenge and then you get the benefit of those who have come before you. Let's talk a bit about the history of gay male long-distance relationships. In our modern world increasingly we have a sense that people are mobile. We're not just born in a place and then live there and die there for our whole lifespan. Straight or gay, people are often born in one place and live in at least several others before their life is done. In the United States, we are a nation of immigrants from other countries in general, but for gay men, we often find ourselves moving away from the cities and towns of our family of origin because we often seek out cities where the LGBT community in general, and gay men in particular, are numerous, welcomed, and enjoy a sense of belonging, equal legal, civil rights, and cultural validation. Many gay men have to leave where they were born and raised in order to achieve this sense of comfort, what we clinical social workers call the goodness of fit with the person in environment theory, which I teach a lot in my graduate course on couples therapy in the School of Social Work at USC, University of Southern California. The challenge is Fortunately, there are many places for gay men to feel this comfort and strong sense of continuity, historically and presently. We've all probably heard of the gay ghettos of America, Hell's Kitchen or Greenwich Village in New York City, DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., the Castro District of San Francisco, Halstead Street or Boys Town in Chicago, Vauxhall in London, the Marais in Paris, the Nullendorf Platz in Berlin, all of Amsterdam. You know, and that's just kind of a Western focus, with all due respect to the guys in Africa, in Asia. I've had such a Western education, I'm kind of undereducated on where, you know, the gay meccas are uh, of the East, pun intended. Anyway, so in today's world, where gay men spend the money they would have spent on raising kids, on travel, basically, we as a group tend to travel to other world gay-friendly destinations for vacations or even for work as gay male professionals in the workplace. It is there that, if it is there, that we meet the guy and fall for him, at some point it's time to go back home. And when this happens, we can be left with the joy of meeting someone we really click with, 
but then have to cope with the disappointment that we don't live in the same city and we can't date regularly like two people who live in the same city could easily. Sure, we could write it off as a vacation fling and forget about it, and while some do, sometimes fate would have it that the relationship really clicks despite the many gay men we might meet back home in the city we live. You know, fate can be a real bitch sometimes. <laughs> That's just the way it works out. So what do we do? Let's talk about finding what works. When I conduct couples therapy, I often educate the couple on my perspective on what works in gay male relationships for both their enduring longevity, lasting a long time, like the marriages we might have seen among our parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles or even our siblings, and according to research, reported levels of satisfaction in the relationship, where they are not just together for a long time, they are together for a long time and are happy doing it. That's the other side of it. So two of the models for couples therapy that I have developed in my practice when conducting gay couples therapy or gay male relationship coaching involve what I call the three C's, commitment, communication, and compromise. And there's another episode on these also of the podcast. And I also use the four levels of making your relationship work emotionally, physically, including both casual touch, affection, and your sex life type, frequency, level of satisfaction. Number three, domestically, making a home together under one roof, sharing chores, sharing finances, developing a decor, making your house an actual home. And number four is managing the other, which is coping with the stressors that intrude on a gay male relationship from the outside in, such as dealing with a demanding job that one of you or both of you have, a disability, a bad political climate, some kind of stressful living conditions, jealousies and boundaries, intruders or underminers to your relationship, managing the other from the outside. When we talk about long distance relationships, we're talking about that third one, making your relationship work domestically. Because in a long distance relationship, you might be very emotionally connected, even in love, on level one. And you might have great sex when you're together, and even perhaps when you're apart, more on that later. And you might feel a strong and secure attachment. You know, secure attachment is a very clinical term, by the way, that therapists would use in attachment theory. More on that another time. And the two of you manage a strong dyad of, hey, it's you and me against the world, kid. But you might lack the domestic component, which is making home and hearth together where you sleep, eat, play, and just live in the same place, not just city, but especially the same house or condo or apartment or flat, we would say, the, my British friends. <laughs> so others too. Americans would say apartment, others I think would say flat. But anyway, you're living in the same, under the same roof. And whenever I talk about gay men's mental health in terms of managing stress, I talk about adaptive coping which is both cognitive, changing your thinking, and behavioral, changing the things you actually say or do. Like so many other stressors, coping with the pain in the ass factor of dating someone or even beyond dating to a serious relationship with someone in another city or country or whatever is about asking yourself, what can I think or do to make this situation better? And it's a combination of things that will help you get by until one day you might live in the same place and make a home together. It involves similar levels. You know, we have the other levels, the three C's of commitment, communication, and compromise. And we have the four levels of making a relationship work, emotionally, physically, domestically, and managing the other. Let's look at some other levels about making a long distance relationship work. And that, I think, is still the emotional and the physical. But number three would be the economic. Four is the developmental. Five is the social. And six is the existential. It's a lot. Let me repeat those. The levels of making a long-distance relationship work are the emotional, the physical, the economic, the developmental, the social, and the existential. 
So let's look at each of these in turn. This would be a good time to pause and get yourself something to drink. We're settling in here. Okay, so number one, the emotional. So perhaps the greatest sustainment of a long distance relationship, let's call it an LDR for, for now, LDR, long distance relationship, is that you and your partner have an emotional connection mentally, romantically, sexually, and socially that works for you. And you want to preserve that relationship beyond just calling it a fleeting vacation fling. It's about recognizing that you seriously like or even love this person. You are bonded emotionally in a way that crosses miles of terrain or even oceans and continents. When you're in love, the distance doesn't matter because you're always in each other's hearts. And that's the closest two people can possibly be. There are people who live in the same house who can be distant if the love isn't there. So you start with the emotional bedrock of a strong romantic connection first. This often involves the feelings that get evoked in you when you're with or just communicating with this person. Feelings of warmth, relaxation, goodwill, comfort, pride, validation, romance, arousal, acceptance, and even amusement. It can also be recognizing cognitively that you share similar value systems that make you feel compatible, heard, understood, and accepted. Just thinking of him brings a smile to your face and a warmth to your heart and a tingle in um, okay, other places, right? <laughs> Which brings us to number two, the physical. Coping with the physical means that you get used to spending time apart and you physically bond through sex when you're together and you can create a cyber physical response if you have sexting sessions on FaceTime or Zoom or whatever webcam or audio services you can use for an exchange of erotic energy even when you're in different cities. You also cope with the physical distance by sometimes eliminating it, you know, meaning that you go visit him, he comes to visit you, or you meet in some neutral place that you know splits the distance between the two of you. In my long and experience and, and observation, this leads to the next question, the economic. So number three, the economic. If you meet a guy, let's say on a business trip, chances are that you have a job that includes work travel paid by your employer. And this probably implies that you're some kind of sophisticated professional. I mean, baristas do not travel for work. With all due respect to the baristas of the world at Starbucks and coffee houses and servers and all that stuff, it's a different kind of job than these kind of white collar jobs that require work-related travel to clients or customers or colleagues. And this also probably implies that you earn a hefty salary. Jobs that require work travel are oftentimes well-paid professional jobs. And you might have sufficient disposable income that allows you to add on days to a business trip for some leisure travel, including that with your new partner. Or you amass airline or hotel mileage club miles that allow you to travel out to your partner more frequently. If both you and your partner are men of reasonably high means, then the cost of air travel and things like hotel or grand expenses are not a hardship, and then the only real inconvenience of an LDR is the time it takes to get there. In some cases, the budget might even allow for you to live in one city and take a, a pied-à-terre apartment somewhere else where you and your long-distance partner can rendezvous. I observed this example recently with a client. But this is kind of rare because one or more of you would have to have a high income enough that would sustain almost unlimited means to travel. If you're not a man of means and your partner isn't either, then it's going to be harder to sustain your LDR because there just isn't money enough to spend on plane tickets to see each other with any kind of regularity. In some ways, we could even say that gay men sustaining a long-distance relationship is a matter of at least some privilege. And we all know that this varies greatly from gay man to gay man, and is just one more kind of controversial topic in LGBT plus socialization today. Where is the privilege or not, you know? 
just like our world in general, there's an increasing income gap and all that that implies in terms of lifestyle and way of life. Gay men are not immune to the economic politics of the day, even though the stereotype of gay men is that we are affluent because we generally don't have a wife to support or kids to raise. The less money there is for travel between your two locales, the less frequently you would see each other. And that can imply that the long distance relationship is really just pen pals, which usually can't be sustained realistically unless one or both of you have a plan for relocating. And that brings us to number four, the developmental. Developmentally, how old you are might have implications for the LDR. For example, if you're young and you're just out of school years, you might have more flexibility in terms of picking up and moving at your whim. Same thing if you're older and retired, you can sometimes pick up and go because you don't need to think about your local career. If you have some type of career or job where you can move easily, such as a traveling nurse or a flight attendant or a hairstylist or a chef, that can help you move to where he is. But if you're a physician or an attorney or a therapist, a tenured professor, or you have a career that is very closely tied to state licensure or to a local institution or industry, you know, think Hollywood entertainment and TV and film or Wall Street finance, then it might be harder to move without disrupting the evolution of your career. If your partner has the same situation, it's hard for either one of you to move. So if you're negotiating ways to ultimately make your LDR local and make a home and future together, you have to discuss and consider who has the most professional mobility to move to a different location and continue working in kind of the prime of his career. That brings us to number five, the social. You know, another factor in who moves, who moves where, is social. If you have a robust social network and deep social and civic roots in a city, you're kind of a pillar of the community, it would be harder for you to move than your partner who might be in a college town after graduation. You would have to discuss which of your social environments, his, yours, or some new neutral one, is the most conducive for you to set roots down together. Another social component in an LDR, and this is maybe the biggest one, is whether you maintain a monogamous sexual relationship with only you know, masturbation as your comfort when you're apart, or if you negotiate some form of what we call consensual non-monogamy. I'm especially trained in this as a sex therapist, by the way, and I'm continuing with that. And, uh, postgraduate education and consensual non-monogamy in my work with the Sexual Health Alliance in the United States. So that's something that I offer and something that I do that most therapists don't because I've had additional training to become a sex therapist and even more to study couples who have consensual non-monogamy. So this usually involves a discussion about reconciling how connected you feel to one another and having strong romantic or even idealized feelings that you only have eyes for the other with the very practical reality that mother nature is going to give you urges in your libido to have sex probably more frequently than you see one another in person in a long distance relationship and as all of us guys know you know sometimes masturbation just doesn't do the job when you want partner stimulation so i wrote a previous article and I think a, there's a podcast episode I think we did um, on the role and purpose of a fuck buddy about a long distance gay male couple separated by one's partner in graduate school and that explains more about how they handled the very practical aspects of sex as these young virile men while still maintaining their relationship across a, a long distance this particular topic often benefits from relationship therapy or coaching because it can involve your families of origin, your personal values, maybe your spirituality, your differences in your natural libido. In sex therapy, we talk a lot about how to manage differences in libido in a relationship. 
the function of sex in your life. How do you see the role of sex? Is it recreational? Is it stress management? Is it entertainment? Is it to relieve boredom? Is it to express, only used to express profound love? I was working with a monogamous couple just recently where they said no other form of sex is comfortable for either one of them other than that which expresses profound monogamous love, and that happens. It's just that in the gay world, worldwide, you know, you have a certain number of gay male couples who are monogamous only with each other, and some who are consensually non-monogamous, where they play separately, and then others play together. So there's lots of variations about what that relationship type or arrangement is, and it's based on a discussion of what your emotional and physical, practical, physical, sexual needs are. And nobody's really the boss of anybody else. The agreement comes as a result of discussion about what the needs are and what would be kind of compassionate and humane without being a hardship emotionally or physically for your partner. And that takes discussion. And relationship coaching and couples therapy and sex therapy can help you know, facilitate that discussion. That's a lot of what I do. So this particular uh, topic can be controversial because people can have, you know, really strong feelings about that. Um, you know, there has to be a discussion of the ground rules and just the operations of how you can have an open relationship without hurt feelings. And I did a two-part blog article on gaytherapyla.com called how to have an open relationship without hurt feelings. And then one of my competitors kind of stole that and wrote an article called How to Have an Open Relationship Without All the Hurt. Okay, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but I'm not bitter, right? No, actually I am a little bit because this is a sensitive topic and this is something that I offer that a lot of therapists don't. Um, but be that as it may in my rivalries, um, you know, the ground rules are something that really need a lot of discussion in order to avoid hurt. And even then, you can talk about ground rules, and, you know, sometimes you have to troubleshoot a misunderstanding. And that's especially true in a long distance relationship because you're trying to satisfy the emotional connection that you feel with your partner with, you know, feeling horny and your next visit with him isn't for weeks or months ahead. So all of that leads to number six, the sixth and last level, the existential. So often in my practice, I apply elements of existential psychology. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the point of all this? Why bother? And navigating your long distance relationship involves some discussion where each partner is going on in his life and how much you each foresee what you want out of this lifetime, theoretically for decades to come. And if you think it's way too heady, you know, consider that probably your parents or grandparents are or were together for many decades. Like both of my sets of grandparents were alive and married for over 60 years each because they got married young and they lived to be very old together. And the time goes by faster than you think. You know, today's two gay hunks from a circuit event are tomorrow's cute old gay couple at the retirement complex, you know. That's why when you're navigating a long-distance relationship, you have to develop the ability to project if this is the person you see yourself evolving with over the course of potentially many years in a lifetime. If so, you know, waiting a bit before one of you moves is a relatively short time in the grand scheme of things. It's, it's an investment in a long-term payoff. Scheduling longer vacations can help test whether you would get tired of each other together when you're both working and navigating your respective careers and annual rituals. You know, that's very different from being in vacation mode together, especially when you factor in your respective families of origin and cultural differences. And there was another uh, podcast episode about managing cultural differences in a relationship and for yourself. Let's bring it all home. If all this sounds like I discourage long-distance relationship, it's because I kind of do. 
<laughs> that sounds bad, but you know, you have to consider whether you're pursuing a long distance relationship because you actually have a neurotic fear of intimacy of anyone close in your hometown and that threatens your fragile sense of autonomy and your fear of engulfment by another where you feel like you're going to drown and suffer and be obliterated by the presence of an in-person boyfriend. You know, um, you know, does this go back to having issues or anxieties about having a partner who's like a domineering and demanding father? You know, I've seen all this in clinical practice. Those are real examples of how people can feel and what they need to kind of uncover in a long distance relationship. You know, and you have to challenge this idea, really, are all the local men in your town not worth dating? You know, are you sure you've gotten out there and met enough of the guys who live locally to determine this? You know, if you're from a small town, maybe you have. But if you live in Los Angeles and you can't date anyone without flying to Barcelona, I would really give that some serious personal reflection. Because you have to kind of understand what function is the distance serving for you or its opposite with the proximity to somebody who lives locally cause an anxiety another factor is that gay male relationships don't receive the same social and legal validations that straight ones do particularly the world over and the last thing gay relationships need is another stressor like living in separate cities but the guys I've worked with in a long distance relationship have already considered all this, you know, sometimes a lot. And they remain smitten with and committed to the guy they met on Ipanema Beach in Rio on New Year's Eve. And they relocate to become an American expatriate, making a new permanent home in Sao Paulo for decades and counting, learning the language, Portuguese, as they go along. That's actually a true story. Sometimes Cupid, you know, plays his little tricks and shoots the arrow while you're shooting something else far from home. In these cases, as AA says, living life on life's terms means that you accept the circumstances and you savor and protect the love you found, however initially mm, inconvenient. That's love's deal. It might give you Mr. Right, but it doesn't promise you Mr. Right next door. So if this is your situation and love and life have given you a long distance relationship, you don't have to navigate the challenges of that situation alone. Please consider therapy or coaching for the support that you need to make it work, even if it takes time. Love makes the world go round and sometimes, you know, it's worth the trip. So for more information, email me at ken at gaytherapyla.com or call or text my cell in the United States at area code 310-339-5778. Prefer text, it's a little faster. 310-339-5778. And I, or one of the other staff clinicians, would be happy to help you to be successful in your efforts to manage the long distance relationship. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.